much, Kendra. It's wonderful to be here and thank you all for joining today. Um, I would also love to acknowledge my incredible colleague, Lindsay Har, who is on this webinar with me and Lindsay's gonna tag team co-pilot with me, um, interacting in the chat and sharing some resources and also um, sort of co-facilitating questions that you might have. So um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. If you are in the tri-state area, uh, hope you are uh, safe and warm in, in the snow that we're having today. And um, I'm thrilled to share a bit about um, what we do, who we are, and, and the science behind our model. So as Kendra said, Hip Hop Public Health, we are a nonprofit that is all about improving youth health behaviors. Um, it's a pretty interesting model that is not just about developing resources, but it's about empowering young people to become fierce advocates um, for themselves and also supporting their families. It's a, it's a long story, a little bit longer for this webinar, but the way this organization came together is from this incredible unlikely pair, um, Dr. Alajade Williams, who is a neurologist, um, a tenured professor, uh, uh, an incredible health disparities, behavior change researcher at Columbia University Medical Center, um, and uh, Mr. Doug E. Fresh. And for those of you that are not hip hop adjacent, no worries. Um, Doug E. Fresh is one of the guardians of the hip hop genre. And he's the person who sort of coined the beatboxing phrase and movement and is um, an incredible human being. And they teamed up to create this, you know, rather revolutionary approach to health education and health communications. And it really all started when Dr. Williams was working at Columbia, but also at Harlem Hospital in New York City in the late 90s. Um, he had created uh, a whole new stroke center. It was this beautiful center. Um, and it was really underutilized. People were coming into the hospital not knowing that they had suffered a stroke. And for many of you, on this webinar will know stroke is a very time dependent disease. And so if people can get to the hospital within four to six hours, there's these incredible clot busting treatments. And so Dr. Williams hypothesis was, well, how can we reach these younger people, 20 to 50 year olds? And he said, well, what if we could teach their children? What if we could teach their children the signs and symptoms of a stroke so that they would have the agency to recognize those symptoms, but also the agency to call 911? He said, well, why would young people even want to learn about stroke? It's not really a young person's disease. So, well, what if we could work through music? What if we can teach them through music in, in a way that uses evidence-based messages and um, Dr. Williams ended up teaming up with Dougie Fresh, and it, uh, it it's in the history book. So this started, you know, late 90s. Um, there were a series of uh, NIH funded research, randomized controlled trials, and it was wildly successful. And what we've been doing at the nonprofit at Hip Hop Public Health is taking the resources that have been built and spreading and scaling them throughout New York City, throughout the tri-state area, throughout the country and around the world. Um, but before we get into the model, I wanna, wanna talk a little bit about music in the brain. Um, I am not the neurologist in the family. However, if Dr. Williams was here, he would say that there is more neural real estate in our brain for music than language itself. More than half of our brain's real estate can handle music in both hemispheres. And so I want you to take a moment, close your eyes if you like, think back to a moment in time, maybe the day you met your first date or an incredible experience where music was playing. And I bet you could remember those words to that song that might have been playing. And it's that way because music can permeate both hemispheres. It can be retained, recalled in ways that if someone even just told you something, 
it wouldn't happen. And what's so interesting about this is that it enhances learning, um, it enhances memory retention. And then if you learn something through music, even if you don't like the music, even if you don't associate with the music, it's gonna stick with you. But if there's a mode of connection, if there's a cultural connection, there could be even deeper connections. And then if you have multi-sensory experiences, so if there's a, a movement experience, a kinesthetic experience, along with the auditory and the visual, it makes learning and retention that much more impactful. Um, for all of us in the public health and education field, I'm sure there was some point in your, in your journey in becoming the leader that you are where you made up an acronym, where you made up uh, some catchy phrase to remember something as you were studying something. And so like these sort of tricks, these neurological properties of music have been used pervasively in the advertising world, in the marketing world. Um, and so Dr. Williams, you know, was thinking, well, why don't we use this for public health? Why don't we use this more for health education? You know, advertisers and marketers, you know, some of you may have seen this big event the other day. Uh, was that just two days ago, the Super Bowl, um, where there was lots of music infused, lots of music of people's youth, lots of music involved in all of these advertisements to get people to think about purchasing or joining or things like that. And so applying that through a public health lens, through a, through a health education lens, is something that we, we um, harness in a, in a big way. It's a big part of our model. The other thing I just want to mention about music, which you probably just know innately, is that it also reflects our mood. It, it, it can be very emotive. It can, you, you turn on a song, it could lift you up, it could calm you down, it could motivate. So there's there's this incredible um, property of music to connect emotively. And also the beauty of it is that it can be culturally tailored. So we are hip hop public health. I would say, and our founder would say, you know, our model could be used with any kind of music, right? But for us, we really cared deeply. At first, we started this intervention in Harlem in New York City. And primarily we are, you know, focused on connecting with communities of color. And that's why we started with hip hop. What's interesting though, for those of you that are not as familiar with the hip hop genre, as of 2017, hip hop is the number one consumed music genre across the US and around the globe. So it is, it is something that young people and people over multiple generations. Last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the genre, which actually was built out of, you know, frustrations around the social determinants of health, right? It was young people in the Bronx who got together when the Bronx was burning to share the frustrations of where people were living and working and playing and praying and and really having this sort of social justice cry out to the communities and to others. And that's the element of hip hop that we connect to. So a little bit about our model, um, this model that was formulated over, you know, uh, more than a decade and a half of NIH efficacy and uh, effectiveness studies is the multi-sensory, multi-level health education model. And what you see spinning here you know, our vision was a record. Not everybody knows what a record is these days, or even a CD, a compact disc. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, just like Google it, you'll you'll see what I'm talking about. Anyway, but but what that is that represents the social ecological model, right? With with young people at the center, the intrapersonal, the interpersonal, the family, the organizational structures like schools, community, and then the policies. So when we create resources, we wanna understand how that resource will impact up and down across SEM. And then what we do with our model is that we layer science, art, and culture on top of it. And so what, what do I mean by that? When it comes to art, and I know this is a bit of a wonky slide, but I, I know I'm in, I'm in public health, uh, 
friend territory here, so I think you may appreciate this. When we look at art, we're talking about mostly music, but it's also dance and movement. It's the aesthetics, it's animation, it's live action video, it's narrative storytelling. Um, it's also the way that we can really grab attention, especially around challenging public health issues or health education concepts, right? Um, a lot of times, connecting through an art lens can break down barriers in ways that if you just told someone about something um, will be incredibly effective and it kind of softens some messages. When we talk about culture, um, we use cultural adaptation frameworks when we're building our resources and we want to make sure that those that are the focus, the targets of our resources that we develop are included within that process so that it is culturally relevant and culturally tailored. And for us also, we look at the culture of hip hop, not just hip hop as a genre, um, as we develop and iterate on the process of rolling out and, and sharing our resources. And when it comes to science, it, it, it's multi-layered. So it is about using evidence-based strategies. It's also, as I mentioned, before when I was talking about music and the brain, it's it's harnessing the neuroscientific properties of learning and retaining and recalling through music. So the 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 concepts of stickiness, the um, uh, alliteration, repetition, cadence, rhyme, which which hip hop is a wonderful subject for, right? Um, but then there's also like the the absolute you know combination of this iterative process of working with this very unique transdisciplinary team to test to see that it is effective and efficacious and then once it is we then shift it from the research team and then add it to the nonprofit so that we could share it out widely so a bit about our transdisciplinary team it's it is probably the most unique team I've ever worked with, with MDs, PhDs, educators, um, and young people from the focus groups that we, you know, want to support and represent. But then also artists, you know, the creatives, the animators, the the singers, the songwriters, um, and blending this all together in a way so that um, we can see these different elements come together in the production and the dissemination of of our resources and if you really want to get into it i know we'll share the slides afterwards um, you can take a look at our research on our website which really gets into the various models but you could see the scientific um, and peer-reviewed journal articles that have been published in different areas of um, health communication and health content creation Another piece of our model that I'd love to highlight is the child mediated health communication framework. So going back to the original story of creating these resources around stroke, you know, the young people were the primary targets, but really their parents, their guardians, those that they lived with, their caretakers were the distal targets. And so we think that there is great power in supporting young people, almost as the community health workers of their families. Um, and we have uh, some interesting evidence base around this, not just around stroke, but around menu uh, board literacy, purchasing behaviors around nutrition, um, and other areas you can check out on our research page. So, you know, I mentioned before, we have this interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, transdisciplinary team coming from many different areas of health behavior change and health education. But we also have this really unique um, artist advisory board. And the folks that you see here from Dougie Fresh, Chuck D, Cheryl Salt, James of Salt and Pepper, Daryl DMC McDaniels from Run DMC, Ashanti, who's R&B hip hop adjacent. Um, these folks aren't, you know, they're not, um, you know, paid, uh, influencers for us. They are co-creators. They are thought leaders. They are trusted messengers from a community 
and communities that have looked up to them for decades um, that are really iconic and they are socially conscious and care very much about um, health literacy and health equity. Um, if you know of other artists that, that are on your mind that you may have a relationship that would be interested in getting to know us, please, please direct them our way. Um, another thing that I wanna mention is, and, and many of us you know, saw this come to life throughout COVID, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, is that you could have the evidence-based message and you can have a really critical moment, but if you don't have the right medium or the right trusted messenger to get that out, those evidence-based messages or those behaviors are not going to come into practice. And so being able to blend the MDs, the PhDs, the EDs with the MCs has been so critical in terms of having this web of trusted messengers as we spread and scale the resources. So this is probably one of my favorite parts. And um, uh, I think it's, you know, if for those that may have children or young people in their life and they say, well, what are your, who, who's your favorite? These are, th these are our resources, our resources. And, you know, people say, which one's your favorite? I mean, they're all incredible. I'm biased, but they're wonderful. And so we have an on-demand um, learning studio that has over 250 free resources. They are evidence-driven. They are meant to build health literacy on a path towards health equity. And um, they range from all areas of health promotion and disease prevention. So after that work started in the early 2000s around stroke literacy, um, Mrs. Obama, Michelle Obama, former first lady, had gotten wind of the work that Hip Hop Public Health was doing and said, well, are you doing anything around physical activity and nutrition in the childhood obesity space? And in fact, yes, because those of you that are in the stroke literacy world, stroke prevention and obesity prevention line up really well when it comes to increasing physical activity, um, when it comes to healthful choices. Um, maybe the only difference is around not starting smoking, right? And so Dr. Williams was already doing work in that space. This is around 2011. Um, and then Hip Hop Public Health teamed up with the former first lady around Let's Move. Anybody remember Let's Move? It was an initiative of the White House and Mrs. Obama to really increase physical activity and access to healthful eating um, in a non-judgmental way. And so we ended up creating an entire album called The Songs for a Healthier America. You'll see it on the bottom right corner of the screen. And that's where Dougie Fresh then reached out to all of his other friends like Chuck D and DMC and Ashanti. Even actually Ariana Grande is on that. It was in it was launched in 2013, um, right before she became a little bit popular. And you know, those that were like pop, hip hop adjacent are on there as well. And it was uh, a beautiful album that really focused on increasing physical activity, exploring fruits and vegetables, staying hydrated with water in a really fun way. And it had live action videos and animated videos to go along with it. Um, and since then, we begin to build upon all of that. Um, I would say up until the pandemic, if you looked at our website, you would have seen that our mission was really all about turning the tide on childhood obesity. We were heavily focused on physical activity and nutrition. And then March 2020, we realized that our communities are already feeling the impact of mis and disinformation, you know, as the science is evolving on the on COVID, on vaccines, on treatments, um, we felt it was so important to get into that mix of developing literacy around the simple behaviors that can prevent and mitigate COVID-19. So we started with hand washing, then mask wearing, and then went on a whole 
two year journey of COVID literacy. Um, we ended up doing these resources in English and in Spanish. Um, and when we did resources in Spanish, of course, they were culturally tailored in a way that it wasn't just translated. We worked with different artists, different type of music, different vibe, so that it really, really, truly connected. Um, community immunity that you see in the center of the screen and Immunidad Comunidad are the COVID vaccine literacy series. Um, 20 seconds or more and 20 segundos or más are the hand washing series and behind the mask. Um, but what we noticed was that we could apply this model really to any area of health promotion and disease prevention. And that's what we've been doing since 2022. And I think when we started, uh, we had 700, not 700, 70 resources uh, in 2017, and now we've grown to over 250 resources. So how do we help disseminate these resources um, around the tri-state area and around the country? Well, we have a free program called Health MCs. MCs are the masters of the classroom. The classroom could be a physical classroom. It could be the living room. It could be the community center. It could be the faith-based institution. It's any place where health education and public health work takes place. And what we've done is not just, you know, make available these, you know, few hundred resources that are songs and videos, but we've created um, really in-depth toolkits that have educational materials, that have lesson plans, and I'm biased, but these are they're unbelievable. They're, they're incredibly thoughtful in the way they're put together in terms of having clear learning objectives, standards or line alignment um, for those that are working in school settings that are related to health education standards, physical education standards, social emotional learning standards. Um, but there's also family materials. And so uh, here's just a little sample of some of the toolkits that you find on our website. Um, and as I mentioned, a range of resources. One of the parts that I love the most on the teaching material side of the street, in addition to the lesson plans, there's an entire lesson slide deck. So these resources are available not just to download, but to adopt and adapt. Like the slide deck is available in Google Slides. So people can make a copy, they can tweak it, the slides also have facilitator notes. Um, so we've we've worked, you know, tirelessly with focus groups of educators in a myriad of set of settings to build these resources. Um, and we love to hear feedback. So if you have additional feedback or how it's being used or received, um, it's really important for us to have that iterative process. And speaking of that, for all of the the toolkits we have what we call no stress learning checks. And so they are pre and post really simple learning checks that could be used before resources are shared, after resources are shared. Um, and it's very simple to become a health MC. Oop, I'm gonna go back for a minute. All you need to do is register on our website and it is free. Um, when you register, there is a very brief survey that we ask. And we want to know, you know, where are you coming from? How do you think you might be using these resources? Are you in a school? Are you a community health worker? Are you an administrator? Um, why do you look for, you know, uh, health literacy resources, a bit about demographics? Um, and then if for those that would love to participate with us in focus groups, in research projects, we love to know that right away. Um, as many of you out there, and you know, even the beginning of this webinar, where a lot of our work is grant funded, you know how important it is to be able to share the reach and the spread and the scale, and it really helps us apply for other funding and keep all of these resources free. That's something that's very important to us. We want to make sure make sure that we take away barriers to access in terms of quality, evidence-based, 
resources and wraparound materials. And what's interesting is every time we go to a conference or anywhere, whether it's virtually or in person, people say, well, when is it not free? Like it is free, free. It is not free. And then at some point you have to pay for it. It's free. Um, and we work really hard on looking for grants, collaborations with other organizations that are looking to um, highlight pressing public health issues and deepen health education in schools and communities. So think about hip hop public health. If there's a grant that you're going after that you think might be interesting for us to co collaborate on. Um, one of the series of resources I'd love to highlight are our HYPE resources. Um, HYPE stands for Helping Young People Energize. Young people, you know, the idea was really about school-aged children, but we think about young people as being young at heart. And when we first created our HYPE dance breaks, it was really all about helping to increase physical activity. This was pre-COVID. So it was about um, creating these two minute, six minute, 10 minute, maybe a little bit extended dance breaks um, that you could infuse into lots of settings in the classroom, in the gym, in the library, in the living room or the kitchen, you know, um, where, where young people can have fun and dance and follow along. Educators don't have to be hip hop dancers to be able to implement it. And it was really about increasing physical activity supporting sort of the lack of physical activity, lack of physical education that we see across the K-12 landscape. Well, what we saw during COVID in particular, when everything shut down and people were home, was that it was a wonderful way not just to increase physical activity with no equipment needed um, and really fun music, again, biased, but it's, it's good stuff. Um, we were able to really look at physical activity in terms of supporting mental health, right? And so for us, what we really love about the physical activity dance breaks, it's not just about helping young people get focused or, or, or energized or as transitions that can be done, but it's a wonderful way to bring culturally relevant art forms into lots of different settings. Um, not everyone will be active with sport or exercise, even though dance is exercise, but saying, let's say, you know, going out for a run or getting on a, a large piece of equipment like a treadmill or a bike. Um, but it's also something that for leaders like yourselves, um, you know, being able to add two minutes of physical activity throughout the day, something that you could do on a Zoom. Um, I'm sure you're thinking Lori Rose. We'd love to do a hype break right now, but we're not going to do it today. It's going to be part of what you get to do to follow up. But it's something that, you know, to think about what you can use within your own practice. Um, it's really stressful working in the world of public health and health education. There's so much that we want to do and so many people that we want to support. So thinking about putting our own oxygen mask on through movement, through physical activity. So I encourage you to take a look at them. Um, and there's over 100 resources and a new series that we just launched a couple of weeks ago is Hype Hawaii. And Hype Hawaii was a project with the University of Hawaii at Manoa. These are the choreographers and dancers that are in the videos, um, ranging from Native Hawaiian, Filipino, and Polynesian. Um, and what we were able to do with Hype Hawaii was really work closely with schools and with Native Hawaiian singers and artists and dancers and composers and rappers to really bring Native Hawaiian culture um, and fuse it with a little bit of innovation with hip hop. Um, there's a, an entire soundtrack, which is really a beautiful story of a young boy named Maka talking to his grandfather, his tutu, um, right before he's going to bed. And then as he goes through each of the songs, Maka is like bringing to life a lot of Hawaiian legends through his own, you know, childhood 
lens making up his own little take on it. And so what you'll find if you take a look at Hype Hawaii, you'll find breaking it down videos for each individual move, then you'll see ones that are a little bit longer that are beautifully shot in Hawaii. Um, and also toolkits. Um, we took Lava Surfing, which is one of the really fun songs and created uh, an elementary age and a middle high school age toolkit about how you can adapt this. And so um, May is AAPI month. Um, this might be an incredible resource depending on the population that you're working with. Um, and it's really fun for, for anyone. And it was just launched in early January. Um, so looking forward to your feedback, but this is an example um, where folks at the University of Hawaii of Manoa in the College of Education had reached out to us because they were writing a grant with the U.S. Department of Education um, for the U.S. Department of Education to support Native Hawaiian health and wellness and social emotional learning. And so what we were able to do, again, is apply this model, this multi-sensory, multi-level health education model towards creating culturally tailored, culturally relevant resources. And it's been a beautiful journey working with them over the last year and a half and to see it come to life is really a lot of fun. And so going to that on our website, you can take a look at the stories behind many of our collaborations and, and campaigns. What's on our website under a section called features, and it's really simple to get to it. At the top of our website, there's a there's a menu bar that says our work and under our work you'll see the learning studio you'll see health mcs you'll see features and you'll see this other section which i'm going to talk about in a minute but what i love about the feature section is that it talks about the genesis of the work so it talks about the genesis of the work with the university of hawaii at manoa the the work with former first lady Mich mrs obama but a couple of ones I want to highlight that we didn't talk about that I'd love for you to take a look at on your own is a new resource we launched towards the end of last year called Empower. Empower is a mouthful of an acronym that empowers teens and young adults around asthma self-management. And we did that collaboration along with NEF, the National Environmental Educational Foundation I always get that acronym wrong. And I see Lindsay's like, you got it right this time, Lori. Yes. <laughs> and so NEF, we broke down Empower, um, evidence-based strategies for teens and young adults who have had older folks or the trusted adults in their lives managing their asthma for them. And now they're, they're out in the world moving around and they have to manage it themselves. They're not always around that caretaker. And so E is about environment and M is about medication and O is about open communication and so on and so forth. So I encourage you to check that out. There's also a beautiful poster because Neef really wanted to help create resources specifically for clinicians as well. So for doctor's offices, health centers, school-based health centers, community health centers, that um, was more attractive to young people. And so it looks like a graphic novel of E-M-P-O-W-E-R. Um, and it's something that you could download in full color or in black and white. Um, for free. So that's one of the resources I'd love for you to check out. Another one is Paste Time. Not FaceTime, Paste Time. And Paste Time is a, is a project we launched last year in collaboration with the Colgate Bright Smiles, Bright Futures program. It's all around oral health. It's aiming to get young people and their families to brush their teeth for two minutes, twice a day. And the song is two minutes long. It's bilingual. It's in English and in Spanish. Um, our hip hop doc is actually in the track with Dougie Fresh and this incredible 12 year old named Heaven who has a voice that if you close your eyes, you would say, oh my goodness, she's really 12. Um, it's a beautiful, it, once you hear that, 
that track has got a reggaeton vibe, you're not gonna get it out of your head. And that's the idea, to brush to that song. There's an incredible toolkit that goes along with it. So I encourage you to take a look at Pacetime and, and all the other ones, of course, but I think those are some, the features are some interesting stories um, that talk about the genesis. And also it might be helpful in the work that you're doing, thinking about opportunities for collaborations, whether it's with Hip Hop Public Health or others, but sort of some of the unique ways that these partnerships came together and then flourished. The last part of our work that I'm gonna to share today is a series that's really focused a little bit more on, uh, I would say, older you know, teens, young adults, and adults is a health literacy speaker series that we call Moving the Needle. And I'm dating myself again, but if you look at that, you know, um, logo at the bottom left of your screen, that's a record. And so for us, Moving the Needle dates back to put the needle on the record, but it also is about moving the needle on health and healing, you know, one conversation at a time and destigmatizing conversations around mental health, around pressing public health issues, you know, having a multi-generational lens uh, to really bring these conversations to life. So for example, we've done conversations where we have a medical professional with an artist, you know, a younger artist with with a, a, a more seasoned artist, um, educational uh, professionals, talking with medical professionals, you know, being able to have these very live and direct, as our founding artist Dougie Fresh likes to say, these live and direct conversations that we also love to capture and then share on our website so that people can use them in other means where you know you could be diving into areas around um, mental health um, racism and its impact on the body and the brain you know some topics that are a little bit tough to 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 talk about but important to talk about and with a range of folks sort of again going back to that trusted messenger approach of having the folks that are trusted in the entertainment world, in the educational world, and in the medical world. So please take a look at um, some of the health literacy speaker series, Moving the Needle. And for example, if you have an idea for an event like that, would love to hear about it. Um, and maybe it's something that we can collaborate on. So again, how do you access uh, all of these resources in areas of health promotion and disease prevention? Here is your handy QR code um, that you can register as a health MC. Um, you can do this right now. You could take a little shot of it. It will bring you right to our website. Um, but again, uh, this is something that we love to hear feedback on. We love to hear how you're using it, how you're sharing it. Um, sometimes people think because it's free, it's not stellar. You know, I, I and Lindsay have worked uh, for the New York City Department of Education, which reported to also the Department of Health in New York City. Um, for the Office of School Wellness for like a combined almost 20 years together. And folks would come to us all the time with curriculum to share and roll out. And too often it didn't look like our kids and families. It didn't sound like our kids and families. Um, it wasn't evidence-based. And those of you that focus a bit more on health education, you could probably count on less than two hands how many health ed resources out there are, are evidence-based and available. And none of them are free that are. So um, this is sort of our gift back to communities. We're about building health literacy on a path towards health equity. That's our sweet spot. And you know we invite you to join us on this journey. So thank you so much, um, Kendra. Uh, thank you so much, Rutgers School of Public Health for this opportunity to share more about hip hop public health and 
um, look forward to interacting and, and answering questions that you may have. Thank you so much, um, Lori. That was such a great presentation. Um, and um, I mean, even with having a background um, in health education um, and remembering how I would try to incorporate um, some way of engagement with hip hop with students back in my time when I used to teach on HPV, I see that this can definitely benefit um, the students, especially in the high school settings. Um, so thank you so much. Um, this is really great. Um, the formal way of presenting, you know, to parents, um, but mainly to like the younger generation, this is a great way to share um, information. Um, you know, not only in, in a more engaging way, but they can take this information and share it with their parents who may not understand um, or, you know, what is being um, dialogued like in a healthcare setting. So thank you. Thank um, you. Well, and if I could just react to that, Lindsay, yeah. feel free if you want to chime in as well. Like that's a big part of the lesson plans and the slides in the toolkit. So there are resources for families, how to engage families, how and almost part of um, young people's, let's say if it's in a classroom setting, homework, that it's part of what they need to do and to share, let's get hyped together as a family. Let's teach, you know, the acronym, teach your parents the acronym for be fast for stroke. What does that mean? Through the song and through the dance. And while a lot of times some of the younger kids, some, you know, it's funny with the resurgence of sort of the 50th anniversary of hip hop, there are a lot of younger kids that now know who Dougie Fresh and DMC are. But when a lot of kids come home and they're like, oh, we learned this thing, it's this hip hop music. And the parents are like, wait, what? Dougie Fresh? DMC, what do you know about Dougie Fresh? You know, and so it is, um, it's really a beautiful way and to, to be a little bit more wonky, you know, for child mediated health communication to have that pass through from young people to the trusted adults in your life. Lindsay, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I wanted to, there's a couple questions that are coming in the Q&A, Lori, that I thought you might be interested in addressing. Two of them are uh, sort of connected. Um, so Kathy asks about how we address the so-called bad language factor inherent in hip hop. And Juan Carlos has um, maybe a complimentary question around, I think um, I'll read this question, great information. How do we convince extra conservative school districts to use this program? Any suggestions on how to sell the curriculum and materials? And I, I think you probably have a way to talk about that that kind of connects the two. Sure, well, thank you for those insightful questions. Look, um, we know that the genre of hip hop has moved in many different pathways from its origins, right? For those that may know the Grandmaster Flash song, The Message, right? Which was about social determinants of health, don't push me cause I'm close to the edge, right? It was talking about toxic stress and building up in the places where people were living and working and playing. That being said, all of our music is 100% family friendly to the core, intergenerational friendly to the core. It's not like turning on the radio. This has been built, you know, through these projects. Sorry for a little bit of background noise. It's gonna go away in about three seconds. Um, so it's been built using you know, what do we want young people to know and be able to do as a result of learning these resources? Um, so it's something to have a conversation about. Um, and if we want to be culturally relevant, if we want to think about those that so many young people look up to and a genre that started in the roots of social justice, right? Um, I think it's it is respectful to support and be of the communities, right? To be able to share the resources that grew out of the black community. Like not just say, oh, because there are some people that are cursing a lot or there's, yes, there's a lot of misogyny in some 
parts of the music, but from the guardians, from the beginning of this, it, it was a release. It was a, it was a celebration of life. It was a release and it was a way to communicate. And so, you know, going back to the roots is important. Um, I think also, uh, there's lots of music <laughs> out there, not just hip hop that may not be, let's say, family friendly or school friendly or community friendly. And so I think that is like pervasive, whether it's country music, whether it is pop music. Um, and so understanding that all of our resources are not going to have any of those elements. Um, and, you know, I think you're giving me an idea. I think, Lindsay, I think we can create um, sort of a deck that helps people share this information in a creative way um, so that they can talk through these concerns if it comes up. And I would say, um, you know, sometimes it's working directly with a school district leadership. Sometimes it's about working directly with teachers in the classroom. Sometimes it's about sharing with parents. I'll tell you this. When I worked at the New York, and I'm sorry, my answers sometimes go a little bit like this. When I worked at the New York City Department of Education, and at first I was responsible for physical education, but then health education became under my purview and sex education was part of that. And a lot of the advocates um, in the sex ed and sexual health world were very concerned about this, who's this gym person who's now gonna you know, oversee health. And we had lots of conversations and instead of for this particular campaign at the time, I remember, and this is uh, early, mid, mid 2000s, instead of going to principals and advocacy organizations saying, you know, this is required, sex education and health education is a, is a part of health education, you know, all of that, HIV education is required. Um, they created an, a beautiful campaign towards parents that said, go to the principal's office go to the principal's office and did you know that this is required and did you know that the office of school wellness programs has purchased free evidence-based curriculum for all the schools and that they offer free training and so i say that story to say like that there's many ways of sort of getting in the mix and and that's also why i also shared like the physical activity component sometimes that's a softer way to work in, right? These are ways of supporting physical education, increased physical activity, increasing like support for classroom management. We know that young people or even adults, if we all did a two minute physical activity break right now, I'm sure we'll be more alert for the rest you know, of our morning. So thinking about the creative ways of different pockets of content. If you may be working with a, a community organization or a school district that this might be too much all at once, it might be like, whoa, there's these incredible physical activity breaks that can be done anywhere, anytime. And then when teachers start to explore the resources, they'll see, oh, there's resources around hand washing. There's resources around healthful eating. And so I think that there's many ways to sort of get in the door um shouldn't have to think about it that way but you know i think um understanding how to help solve um educators and administrators problems their challenges so if challenges about focus or they're concerned about academic achievement well physical activity is a really great way to help keep young people on task and also increase their fitness throughout the day in a creative way. I'll stop there because clearly you see I can just keep keep going on. Lindsay, did you have any additional questions? No. Oh, you're on mute. Of course I'm on mute. Um, some of the other ones I'm responding to in writing. Um, 
And Lori, I think you really addressed some of the other questions that came in around the use of hip hop. Um, I don't know, Lori, if, if you want to maybe talk for a couple, um, a little bit also about some of the other musical genres and styles that we blend in. Yeah, yeah. So it's we are hip hop public health, um, and we apply this model to to other areas as well. Um, we have a beautiful collection ca called World Beats. So if you look up World Beats, it is a mostly instrumental collection that really, um, we worked actually with the New York City Department of Education because they wanted music to the other question. They wanted music that they could use in classrooms that didn't have profanity and that they knew would be reflective of the diverse communities across New York City. And so World Beats has everything from hip hop and pop to Afro beats and a little bit of trap and lo-fi and a little bit of reggaeton and salsa. And there's a little bit of everything. The other album that we have a lot of music that can be just used really for anything um, is the Pacer remix. Um, for those of you that may be familiar with an assessment called the Fitness Gram, we did work with the Cooper Institute of Aerobic Research to create a really fun soundtrack for the fitness gram so that it wasn't just beeps and boring tones, but it had diverse voices and shout outs and enthusiasm. But then we took that music and broke it down into individual tracks. So there's a whole hour's worth of music that progressively gets faster. And again, that's a blending of, of hip hop, pop, trap, Latin flavors um, and Afro beats as well. So there really is a range of music um, on the site. Um, I would even say there's in, in Move to Improve uh, World Beats as well. There's Bollywood tracks as well. Um, so yeah, so there's a there's a lot to to comb through. And um, you know, as I mentioned in the pace time track. It's much more of a reggaeton track than than you know a standard hip hop track blending English and Spanish as well. Um, there's a question in the chat. Um, can you can this also be tailored to address school violence and bullying? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think. Uh, you know, if there is an organization out there that you're thinking about that has funding to do that, we'd love to learn more and collaborate. Um, you know, we've had a, a lot of conversations. One of our, um, the artists we work with, DMC, he wrote uh, his own children's book. It's separate from Hip Hop Public Health called Daryl's Dream. And he wrote it as his fourth grade self who was bullied and picked on um, for wearing glasses and liking comic books and Spider-Man and, 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 and poetry, you know, which became rap for him. Um, you're giving us some ideas of thinking about some new resources. But again, resources take resources to create. So if, uh, if there's a grant out there that folks would like to consider collaborating with us on, we're, we're all ears. Or shall I say it's music to our ears? Very nice. Thank you, Lori. Um, we also have a message here from Christy. I'm glad to see this is this to see this, especially as a love of hip hop. I also try to bring lyrics to talk about social justice and social determinant of health in my undergraduate classes at our university. And I'm looking forward to the toolkits to gain better approaches on these topics. Um, Lindsay, I know that you shared some of the links in the chat. If you can share that with me, I can send this to the attendees again via email for those who didn't capture it. Um, and, and I would say, absolutely. Kendra, and we wanna make things easy for all of you. Everything that Lindsay's sending is also connected on our website. So um, we could sort of package it in an easy way. You know, there's a great, um, for the last comment, Kendra, there's a great, presentation that our founder did, um, Dr. Williams with DMC actually on at the Skull World Forum last year. And it's about a, a 20 minute conversation 
about sort of the genesis of hip hop, social determinants of health, and sort of the way that we can use music and poetry and art for social change. It's also in conversation with two other artists. One is Sister Fa, um, who's an artist who who has rapped um, about a, an incredibly serious subject, female genital mutilation, and she has experienced that herself. Um, and also another artist on the panel who presented in Spanish is Ali, AKA Mind from Colombia, who uses his music for peaceful protests and social change. And this panel is about a 20-ish, 30-minute conversation. Um, it's recorded, it's on our website under the news section. Um, but that is something that would be beautiful to share, particularly, you know, in a course as you're talking about it, because there's wonderful references and also people like DMC who lived through the growing up of, of hip hop and feeling that um, from his communities um, as well. Thank you. I'll be sure to share um, the website link as well. Um, that way you can access those resources as well. Well, we are at 10.59. I just want to be respectful to everyone's time. But Lori, this was an amazing presentation. Um, just based off the feedback, I know that everyone can use this um, in their classrooms um, or any particular setting to share, share um, public health information. Um, Lindsay, I also want to thank you again for um, taking care of the chat box and providing the, the links and all of that. Um, this would be, this is very, very helpful. Um, so thank you again. This was really great. Um, thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. I know um, the most common question is if we're going to share the links and um, the evaluation and all of that. Um, I am going to pull up the QR code where you can scan the evaluation um, link, but I will also share that link again via email, just in case you're not able to stay on. Um, mm -hmm. But thank you again, ladies, for again, for a wonderful presentation. Um, and thank you so, uh, so sure. very much for the opportunity. Everything. And it's wonderful to, to meet folks virtually. Please stay in touch, reach out to us. We do check the info 